good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. We're going to begin worship right away with singing a chorus that's familiar to you. Come into his presence. and your will for us during these moments together. Open our hearts and minds to all that you want for us to receive. And Lord, please receive our worship. We have come to do just what we've sung in your presence to give you glory and honor, to worship you together. Help us as we do that, that we shall do it freely and honestly and in tune with you today. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. In your hymnal, it's number 115. Come, Christians, join the same.
unless we prepare for our focus on our stewardship and giving this morning, uh, I want us to hear some words that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in his second letter as he was speaking to them about some of these issues. And Bonnie is going to read this passage of scripture for us. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Amen. What a great orientation to our own giving in the church. Certainly that last verse in particular helps us to understand things in perspective. Comparing what we give with what God has given us, well, there's not much comparison there, is there? He's given us so much more. But there's something in here that always strikes me every time I read this passage. When he writes to them and says, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in generosity. And I, I look at that every time and I think, you know, that... That makes no sense. And it certainly doesn't in the rest of the world. Out of your poverty comes your generosity. But you see, our generosity is not dependent on what we have. At least not materially. It does depend on what we have in us that God has done something in us to change us and change our priorities. And even if we don't have much, we can be generous. Generous in spirit. Generous even with what we have. I was thinking the other day, you know, if a person had a million dollars and they came along and gave a big gift of $10,000 to the church, boy, we don't think that was so generous. And that's 1% of what he has. I mean, yeah, I'm not so sure that's generous after all, is it? And we, most of us, don't have a million dollars to deal with, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that out of our joy, and whatever we have, poverty or some or a whole lot, out of what God has done for us, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be generous. Amen. So I commend you for your faithfulness and your generosity in your giving. God does love a cheerful giver, doesn't he? Because that does come out of a generous spirit. And we have all kinds of ways to do that. We have the little boxes that I completely forgot about last week. I walked out of here with my envelope still sticking in my pocket. So I came by the church in the middle of the week and put it in, in the one in the office door. So there are all kinds of ways you can get it there physically if you're doing that through your offering envelope or a check. You can also do that now online as well. I've not tried that. Pastor says it works wonderfully, so if you want to do that, you can do that. You can mail it into our box number. Uh, 1118 here in Avon Park, and it's on your bulletin there as well. So we have the means, the, the methods to do that. And so as we do that, let's simply commit ourselves to continue to be giving and generous people. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word this morning that reminds us most of all that you have given. And you've given us what we could never have purchased for ourselves, no matter how hard we tried or how much money we ever had. You gave us this gift of salvation that we could not earn. And so we give gifts to you, to 
your ministry, seeking to be a blessing in the ministries that are available through our church, seeking to honor you, to bring you praise, to make this truly an act of worship as we continue to give and support one another through all that happens here in our church. We commit these gifts to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The psalmist writes in a portion of Psalm 126, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And then the psalmist simply writes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Let's sing together to God be the glory.
have come today to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to exalt the name of Jesus. Sometimes I get caught up in all the different things that I need to do, but on the Lord's day, when we gather in his name, the Lord has helped me in recent years to focus on the one thing, and that is to worship him and to lead God's people to worship him. So may everything that we do lift up the name of Jesus. And when we do that, we draw strength and encouragement as the body of Christ so that we will be now ready to go forth into our world proclaiming him and loving people and serving him. So let's continue to exalt the name of the Lord today as we have our time of prayer this morning. And I just want to slow down just for a moment and remind you of a couple things uh, in relation to prayer. Um, Franklin Graham and a lot of our leaders have declared this day, October 25th, as a day of prayer and fasting for our country and for our world. And I think it's quite appropriate to do that, especially as we're just a week or so away from our election and we need the Lord. Amen. We need a lot of things in the United States of America, but most of all, we need the Lord, and we need to hunger and thirst for Him. And righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, and so we need righteousness and godliness to prevail in this world, and we are commanded to pray for our leaders. So as we pray today, let's lift our hearts and focus in and pray for our country and this coming election and i encourage you to do that this week as we uh, trust the lord and his leading and and his provision the lord will the next sunday in my message i as the lord is leading me i want to take time out in that message to pray specifically for uh, our election as well so let's continue to pray for our country and also this coming Saturday, and I'm, I'm going to blame this on the fact that I'm new because it kind of slipped through, but the, the, the Southern Florida District has an annual prayer summit, and it is this coming Saturday, October 21st, um, for the Heartland Mission area. Um, it'll be held at Lake Placid Church, and that's on Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon, but it's also available via Zoom if you want to go online and do that and uh, I'll do my best to try to get the word out how to do that and connect that way but uh, we pray for our missionaries and pray for our work around the world and here on the southern Florida district and and our local churches and pastors so uh, just mark your calendar and between nine and noon on Saturday be sure to uh, talk to the Lord about these things well let's bow before him today and and realize that we're in his presence. Our Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to come into your presence singing, lifting our voices to you. And we are here, O oh Lord, to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to worship you, to exalt your name with our words, with our actions. And we do that, Lord, as the body of Christ. We come united in heart and mind today to worship you. And we know, Lord, that's what you've called us to be, is people who worship you. And, and from our worship, we now are able to serve you. But, Lord, I pray that in this service today, that we would be drawn closer to you, O oh Lord, as we as we lift our hearts to you in prayer today, and we praise you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, that you give us peace, even in these turbulent times in which we live. You are the one who said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. And you gave us your peace, and you continue to give us your peace that passes all understanding that cards our hearts and our minds lord we are grateful today for that good word that comes from you lord thank you for your word today your word is true and and uh, lord you are the same yesterday today and forever but lord you want to change lives you want to change hearts 
And the world says conform to this, but you want to transform us as we present our bodies to you as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. And we're not called to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our hearts that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of the Lord. And so we give you praise and thanks and thank you that we can call on your name today. And we pray one for another. Lord, among us today, I'm sure, are those who are carrying burdens and heavy hearts and maybe hearts full of fear and doubt and worry. I pray today that you will speak your word that reminds them that you are greater and bigger than whatever is going on in their lives. That you want to come and manifest your presence and help them, Lord, with their problems. And Lord, as we pray for our friends and loved ones who are in need today, we're glad that we can pray for them. And we pray the prayer of faith over those who are sick. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to comfort those who are grieving. We see our brother Millard Hicks back there this morning, and we're praying for him and his family. Lord, that you'll continue to be the God of all comfort. And Lord, for the heart sought family. And Lord, we learned today that uh, Brenda and uh, John are away because of a need in their family. And we heard about Dave Collar today and his need and others, Lord. Lord, we don't know all things. We do not need to take time out today to explain it to you because you know all things. We simply put our faith and trust in you and pray the prayer of faith that, Lord, you will raise up the sick, that you will encourage the discouraged, that, Lord, you will make us strong in you today and draw us close to you. We want to be close to you today. We want to hear your heart and receive your word today so that we can become more and more and more like Jesus. So do your good work in your people today. Thank you that we can pray for them and pray for one another. Thank you, Lord, for the prayers of your people, for their pastor and their encouraging words. Would you bless us, dear Jesus, and may everything said and done, may Christ be exalted, and may we be lifted up and encouraged and blessed in you this day, we pray the strong and awesome name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Not long ago in Orlando, they had a great meeting. And there was a president of the National Board of Evangelicals there by the name of Leith Anderson. And in his message, he said to the people, I can't wait to get to heaven. I want to hear what Paul and Barnabas, Aquila, Priscilla, and the 12 disciples might have to say about what it was like in the very beginning to share the good news of the gospel of Christ. You ever think about that? Asking them, we say we want to see Jesus, to take up what Jesus told them to do and be excited about it. Well, then in his next sentence, he said, but maybe when we get to heaven, those same individuals may be waiting on us to ask us, what was it like to live out the end of what Christ proclaimed would be? Now, you know, Matthew 24 says there will be wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and nations will turn against nations and people's going to get offended and they're going to get their feelings hurt and everybody's going to hate each other. But it says, when he has made it known all over this world, every person has had a chance to hear about Jesus Christ. Then... He will come. But folks, this morning, I can't help but think that maybe we're drawing close to the end because of Internet, Zoom, and Zillow, and Vibe, and all this stuff that Josh tries to teach me that I can't get in my head that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but I just can't help but think that maybe we're close, if not there, that everybody has heard. But just in case they haven't, what can you do to make sure that your friends and family has heard. I wonder if he knew 
As he sailed away from Troas, this trip of his would one day change the world. I wonder if he knew that one day he'd be known as the apostle who left it all to serve the Lord. I wonder if Paul knew with each shipwreck and each trial as he wrote the details down for all to see. Every sacred line would become the Holy Bible that be passed on down till it found its way to me. team, don't we? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Appreciate these servants uh, using their gifts and talents for the Lord and His work. We'll take a sip of water. Please bear with me a little bit again today. Before I preach today, I want to just uh, talk to you for just a moment about a few things. First and foremost, my favorite daughter in all the world is in the service today. <laughs> Um, a 
we're happy to have uh, both of our daughters with us today. You met Caitlin a few weeks ago, who lives uh, here in Florida. But our oldest daughter, Carissa, is with us. She's from Indiana. And we are so excited to have her with us today. Yeah, go ahead. So like I said, my favorite daughters are here today. And we have a lot of, uh, a lot of fun with uh, uh, them and, and going to enjoy this week. You know, it kind of snuck up on me. I've been kind of preoccupied here lately with all this new in my life that about a week or so ago, um, my youngest daughter, Caitlin, said, can't wait till next week. And I said, what's next week? <laughs> Dad, Carissa's coming. Oh, I said, oh my goodness, it's kind of snuck up on me, but we're excited and we're going to rearrange our schedule a little bit and spend some time with her. And uh, we're proud of her. She serves at a school in Indiana and they're on fall break. Her husband, Jacob, is not with us serves in the Indiana National Guard, and we're proud of him and proud of uh, uh, our family, and uh, we love our daughters. Our, their brothers are okay, but we really do love <laughs> our daughters and thank God for them. So that's the first thing. Another thing I want to talk to you about just for a moment, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're still living in this COVID season, and my understanding, just uh, from what I've heard recently, that we may have another uptick in cases. And so we're probably going to be dealing with this up and down for a while. So let's continue to uh, look out for one another and pray for one another. And thank you for uh, how you do that. And I encourage you to continue to do that. But we're also having to think smaller. And uh, that's okay. Instead of gathering in large groups and different functions of the church and fellowships and all of that, uh, let's think smaller. And when I look at uh, the early church, they met from house to house. They were smaller, but did they not do great and awesome things in their smaller groups? And so let's, uh, let's do that. Some of you, I've already been in a few homes, but we're, we're just being cautious where we want to respect you and honor you and take care of you. So if you want to come by the office when I'm around, that's okay. Smaller groups and we want to meet in the fellowship hall. And if you want to invite me into your home, that's great. I want to take care of you. I want to be available to you. I want to have, I want to be accessible to you. And so um, let's continue to pray for one another and think about one another during this time and and uh, be encouraged. The, the last thing I want to mention is next Sunday, the first Sunday of November, uh, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And uh, I have put on the calendar, uh, uh, and I told the church board this, that every first Sunday of the month will be Holy Communion Sunday. So we're looking forward to serving uh, the Lord's Supper and participating in the Lord's Supper with you next week and we're gonna we're gonna do it a little differently but uh, it'll be a, a meaningful time and and of course uh, it's always uh, experience to uh, share in the Lord's Supper as the body of Christ all right I'm ready to preach now we're turning this morning to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossians Colossians chapter 1 and I'm going to begin my reading at verse 15 and uh, read through verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 and uh, verse 15. And um, we're going to um, begin, before we read that passage, I'm going to tell you a story. There was a younger pastor just starting out in ministry. And he went to an older pastor who had spent a lifetime in ministry. And the younger pastor said to the older pastor, I'm getting ready to start my ministry, and you've been in ministry all your life. Would you give me a good piece of advice to help me get a good start in my ministry? The older pastor thought for a moment and said, yes, I'll give you this piece of advice. Every sermon that you preach, every encounter that you have with the people of God in their homes, in hospital rooms, wherever they're at, 
out and about in the community, whenever you see people, he says, point them to Jesus. Keep the focus on Jesus. And if you do that, you will always be on the right path. And then the older minister looked at the younger <coughs> minister and affectionately said, Son, love Jesus with all your heart and love people and it'll be okay. That older pastor's name was Wyatt Gentry and that younger pastor was me. And I've always tried to keep that as the focus. Keep the focus on Jesus. Every sermon that I preach, every time I meet with somebody, I want to make sure that I point them to Jesus. I don't want the focus to be on me. I don't want the focus to be on the world. I want the focus to be on Jesus. Well, that's what Paul is doing in his letters to the churches. We, um, we see over and over again how he uh, begins with Jesus, keeps the focus on Jesus, and helps the church to understand who they are in Christ. And when they understand who they are in Christ, they will be ready to impact their world for Christ. So Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, and here is the reading. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have the first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let me hold it up today. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be yes, to God. thanks be to God. I, um, I noticed this about this particular letter to the Colossian church. And um, there's a lot of similarities in what we would call the, the prison epistles of Paul. And that would be Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. You see a lot of similarities. But the difference here is that uh, Paul takes us all the way back to the beginning, brings us to the present, and then gives us a word that will take us forward into the future. It's a great picture that he gives to the church, and, and uh, I was fascinated by just reading and studying this again. But we see that Paul is writing in prison. And this particular passage before us has been become known as an early Christian hymn. Now get the picture this morning. In prison and a hymn. This would not be the first time for that to happen for the Apostle Paul. You could go back to the book of Acts and you remember that he and Silas was in prison. And the scripture says at midnight they began to sing hymns. And a great earthquake took place. And the prison was shaken, and, the, and, the, and they were all set free. And the, the, the jailer thought, oh, my goodness, I'm in trouble. And he was going to take his own life. And Paul says, we're all here. And the glorious thing took place that day. And the jailer and all of his family got saved and were baptized. And it was a great and glorious moment for the church. You can sing in prison. Now, sometimes we have our own prisons in life. You may be here today and you're kind of bound in a prison of doubt, fear, worry, you name it. Whatever the 
human emotion that may be the strongest in your life right now, based on your circumstances, based on the problems that you're facing, let me let us and Paul help us today. Let's sing. I need to tell you this right offhand. I probably should have shared this way back in the interview with the church board, but I'm going to go ahead and reveal this to you now. I don't sing. I don't play an instrument. I wouldn't know a note if it run by me and said, I'm a note, I'm a note, I'm a note, I'm a note. But I think I want to sing my sermon today. Because that's what Paul did. He sang this word. It became an early Christian hymn. And granted, again, he was in prison and he sang these words. And every good song has at least three verses, right? Every good sermon has at least three good points, right? So let's sing all three verses of this this morning together. I'm going to sing it as I preach it. I promise I won't sing it as a song. I'll just let it sing, and let's let the words sing to us today, because I believe the Lord wants to get us out of prison. Yeah, he, does. he wants to get us to that place where we're free in Him, where we can be everything that we can in Him, and not get bogged down and frustrated and discouraged by what's going on in the world. And I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and ignore reality. I We all live in a real world today, and there are real problems out there, and there are things that are overwhelming, and I'm not so sure about a lot of things today, but I'm sure of this one thing today. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The focus on Jesus. And so verse number one, he sings about Jesus as the supreme creator. Now, sometimes we have a tendency to uh, break the Bible down into different parts, and we say the Old Testament is about God the Father, and, and the Gospels is about Jesus, and the book of Acts and beyond is about the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you today that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is involved from cover to cover. Right. You don't separate the Trinity into parts. They are one. And so we see in this first verse when Paul sings about Jesus Christ, the supreme creator, he says, and these are powerful words, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, there's not a lot of places where you can say all things and everything, but when it comes to Jesus and his creating power, he created all things, the scripture says. So we can go back into the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus was there. He is the pre-existent Jesus. He is a part of the creation. And so we sing today, and we connect the dots of the creation story to this good word that Paul sings to the church, and we find some powerful, powerful truth that will connect us to where we're at. Not only does he create, but he recreates. Yeah. And we have the wonderful privilege today to, from this passage, as we think about God the creator, Jesus the creator, we not only realize he created the heavens and the earth and everything that we see in God's creation that is beautiful and good, that he declared beautiful and good, we also can, we can also sing today of his recreating power for when we come to Jesus, the scripture says, and Paul tells the Corinthians, we, uh, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins, but now have been made alive in Christ. Old things have passed away. 
and all things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ. So the one who created this world wants to create in us, renew us in his image, get us back to that original intention in which we were created, and that is to glorify and praise God. And yes, sin got in the way and messed everything up and the fall of man and everything went downward like that, but God sent his son into the world to die on a cross so that not only will we experience and be renewed in the creating power of God, but we'll also see that he has something new to do in you and me. And he continues to do that, his grace of creating. God is always creating something new. He's always doing something new. I don't want to settle for just the old. I want to live in anticipation that God is doing something new. Well, when he says he's the firstborn over all creation, that word actually means that he is above. He is superior, and it's, it's a word of honor. And so you see the word all things here, and you now, as we've already said, you connect the dots of creation and redemption. And uh, I'm the dot-to-dot -dot preacher. I'm always looking for that. When I see that in Scripture, I see that becomes a part of the good news. So I can share and I can preach and I can live the reality of these words that the God who creates is the God who continues to create in you and me. He's doing something new. I want him to do something new for us. Something fresh, something alive, something that will transform us. The world is saying conform, conform, conform to this, this, and this. And it leaves us in a, a, a time of uncertainty and confusion. I am so confused by everything that's going on in our world today in terms of politics, in terms of what's going on in the economy and so, and so forth and so on, in education and business. And uh, there's, uh, we're all over the place. And every once in a while, somebody will say, I have the answer. And they'll say, we need to focus on this. And then after a while, they say, no, that's not it. It's this. And then they change again. The world is always changing and jumping from here to there. In terms of its emphasis, I'm glad that I can focus on the one who says, I never change. And he is doing his work of creating. And so I look at this and I see in Paul's day... There was the false teaching. What did they try to take out of the picture? They could not get a grasp on the scandal. And it was a scandal to a lot of people. The cross. It was unnecessary for Jesus to die on the cross. God could have came and, and did his work without the cross. So Paul, in his words, elevates the cross again. It reminds that the cross is the sacrifice, the ultimate superior sacrifice for our sin. And so in seeing this, he's, get, he's taking us all the way back to the beginning and seeing God's intention and God's purpose and how through Jesus God is, God is fulfilling his purpose in you and me. Is he fulfilling his purpose in you today? Or are your eyes on the world? Are you overwhelmed with everything that says conform to this, this, and this. Instead, let's let these words sing a song to us that will cause us to lift our voices above the world, above this sinful world, above the circumstances of this world. And we see Jesus high and lifted up and exalted as he's intended to be for you and me. He is the supreme creator. The second verse he is the supreme ruler. Notice in verse 16 what Paul says here as he talks about the creating power of God. He says all things. And I noticed in this seven times Paul uses the word all. <coughs> and then in verse 18, he, and verse 18 is like the, the, it's right there in the central part of this passage. But he says he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And then in ver the latter part of verse 18, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Did you see that line? I pray that it will lift off the page to you today. He is the supreme ruler of our life. 
And when we let him have first place in everything, he becomes Lord of our life. Amen. The Lordship of Jesus is elevated here. We've already seen him elevated and sung about in terms of his supremeness as creator. And now we see him as the supreme ruler. A little boy was in Sunday school one day. The teacher was trying to help the students to just get their minds wrapped around the sovereignty of God, the greatness of God. And, and uh, the teacher was way above their heads, couldn't quite get it down to where the kids could understand it. But finally, one little boy raised his hand, said, Teacher, I think I know what you're trying to say. You are saying to us that God is large and he's in charge. <laughs> And the teacher said, why don't you take over the class and teach the lesson today? Because I've made, I have not done very well, but what you just said summarizes everything. He's large today. He's bigger than anything we can think or imagine. He is awesome. And he's in charge. I'm glad for the day when I let him be in charge of my life. I let him have first place in everything. You remember that day? If you haven't done that, I, I encourage you this morning, let Jesus have control of everything. Let him be first place in everything. And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll let the world once again try to conform us to what it says. And there are a lot of, I call them the talking heads. You see them on the news and all these programs... We are, we are in an election season, right? You remember that? <laughs> the talking heads. They talk, talk. They just talk it to death. Yeah. Talk. That's all you hear about. And um, every once in a while, I think it'll do us all good because I think it kind of gets to our emotions and it wears heavily on our mind. Yes, I think we should be concerned about what's going on and we need to be informed and all that. But let me tell you a good piece of advice. And I've given this to people who are discouraged and worried about everything that's going on in our world, in our country. Turn the TV off. Amen. And open the word. And realize from beginning to end, he's in charge. Right. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto him. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I've read the last page of the book and we win. Amen. He's going to have the final amen. The final say so. So why don't we in the meantime just let him have complete control of everything. Let him rule. Now in the word here is uh, for a ruler in that day was one who conquered and one who is in control. Now we know the Roman order of that day, that's what they did. They conquered and they let everybody know that they were in control. As you see the birth of the church and the, and the explosion of God's church in the New Testament, you see that when God's people let Jesus be the one who conquered sin and helped them to have new life in Christ, and when they let him have complete control of their life, things were out of control in terms of what the world thought. Sometimes we think this world is out of control, and I think you can make a case for that if you're looking at it from that perspective. But when we look at it through the eyes of Jesus, when we let Jesus be Lord of everything and have complete control of our lives, there should be this peace about us that realizes that whatever happens in this world God is in control. Amen. He is on the throne. And he conquered not through a through like the Roman order of that day through through war and intimidation and control physically. He conquered by his death upon the cross yeah. and his resurrection. Up from the grave yeah. he arose Amen. with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He rose victorious over the vast domain. Yeah. And now we are called to praise his name forever. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. I think we need to sing about his Lordship today. Yeah. 
Sing it loud in this world and let the world know that whatever happens on November 3rd, Jesus is still going to be Lord. Right. Whatever happens next year or next year, you know, in 10 years from now, if the Lord tarries and we're still here every day, every moment, we live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's good news, church. Let's sing it today. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. He is on the throne. He is large and he is in control. Now, Jesus helped us. If we just continue to keep our focus on Jesus, what did he say? My kingdom is not of this world. He talked about, and you, you see it in his sermons and the parables that he gave, he talked about the kingdom of God, the reign and rule of God. Again, when we let him have Lord of our life, when we get self off the throne of our life and let Jesus be Lord, transformation takes place. Everything up to that point in my life when I was in control of my life and sin was in control of my life I always conformed to something or someone but now when Jesus is Lord of my life he continues to transform making me more and more like himself and he rules and his lordship his kingdom is not like this world in fact when you look at Jesus when you look at Paul, when you look at those who, who kept the faith and thank God for their, their example and the inspiration that we read of their faithfulness to God, they realize that whatever happened in their life, Jesus was Lord. So maybe that's why Paul sang these words from prison. I can't get away from that. Because we can sing in the midst of whatever is going on in our life. Because he is the supreme ruler. The last point, the last verse, is Jesus Christ is the supreme savior. And once again, he goes back and he helps us to see. Actually, he prays for it before he even gives us this hymn in the earlier verses of this chapter. when he, he uh, And this is what he prays for them. He says, uh, from this reason, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a worthy manner of the Lord to please him in every respect, bearing fruit and increasing in good works and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all the steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He prays that for the church. And then he gives us the words of salvation. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transformed us in the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so then he, he right there in the middle, he talks about Jesus as the head of the church. In verse 18, and then he says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Through the blood of his cross, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Jesus is the supreme Savior. He is the one who paid the ultimate sacrifice so that you and I can have forgiveness, that you and I can have new life in Christ. We are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins, but we now have been made alive through Christ. And because he lives, I live. And I live now not in the flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we can testify with Paul, and it has become my, my life verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live, in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 
2.20. That's my birthday verse. <laughs> I was born on February 20th. 2.20. In Galatians 2.20 is my spiritual birthday verse. You might try this sometimes. I've helped people with this and and had a lot of fun with this over the years. Whatever your birthday is, mine's 220. Whatever your birthday is, find the numbers and then search the scripture and find yourself a birthday verse. Now, hopefully it won't be one of those verses that says something terrible and awful. and <laughs> You don't want that to be your birthday verse. But if you search, I believe the Lord will give you a birthday verse. It's always been my birthday verse. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Once again, Paul is singing about Jesus, the supreme Savior. All the things that we try to find to fill the void in our life, the emptiness, all the things that people do to try to get rid of the pain and the hurt. And there's a lot of that in this world today. In my ministry in recent days, uh, through my work with marketplace chaplains, I have encountered people who have lost people that are precious to them because of COVID. In fact, the other day, I was uh, on my day off, I was walking in a park and, and I went around and I saw this lady coming this way and she looked kind of familiar and I said, hello, how you doing? And kept going. And then I made my way around again, and I run into her, and we both made eye contact, and I stopped, and I said, Gwen, is that you? And she said, yes, Pastor, it's me. And let me tell you about Gwen. She works in a, in a, a, a nursing home, and, and um, th this particular nursing home has been hit very hard. If, you, if I tell you the name of it, you'll probably be familiar with because it it's been in the news all these many months. But over 60 residents of that nursing home died of COVID. And over 25 of the team members, the employees that worked there, caught the virus. And Gwen was one of them. And I said, Gwen, how you doing? And she raised her hand, and you could tell she loves the Lord. She said, Chaplain, I was positive. But let me tell you how the Lord has been working in my life. And I stood there with Gwen, and for the next 20 minutes, she told me how hard it was. She said, we have experienced death like you will not believe. And I said, I know. I heard the reports and followed with you and checked in with the leadership and prayed over the phone with many people and families. And during this time when you couldn't go in and see people, I, I know you guys have really been through it. And she said, but even in the midst of death, she said, God's wonderful peace Amen. has come time and time again. You see the big smile on her face. Well, let me tell you about Gwen. Let me go back a little bit. She told me it was a year now since this happened. But a year before, before that, her dear mother passed away. Now, Gwen is African-American. And I went, as a representative of Marketplace Chaplains, I went to her mother's funeral. Have you ever been to one of those services? It lasted over two hours. But they worshiped the Lord. And I was the only white guy in the whole place, so I stood out. And she remembered that. She said, Chaplain, I saw you there. Thank you for coming. It meant so much to my family. So she says, Mama died one year ago. And I said, yeah, I remember that service. She said, I'm learning how to live daily in the reality that though mama is gone, I'm going to see her again because of the resurrection. She said, I'm going to live and live every day until that time when I get to see mama and I get to see Jesus again. She's tears running down her face. We were getting blessed. There were people walking by us on the trail, and they probably thought, what in the world is wrong with these people? We're rejoicing. And I... And I need to tell my chaplain supervisor, I said, you know, there's all ways you mark these calls that we have to make. And there's different, it didn't fit in any of the categories. But I had an encounter 
with a dear woman who loves Jesus who'd been through it. Death of her mother and then seeing death and then experiencing all of this herself. But she said Jesus has been so precious Amen. through it all. Through it all. I want to sing today about the supreme creator, the supreme ruler, the supreme savior of our lives. I want to lift that name of Jesus up in the midst of this world that is such a mess today. And there's so many problems. And let me tell you, these problems are not going to be solved on November 3rd. They're not. But when we look to Jesus and he gives us a, a renewed sense of his presence and we see his word come alive again and his Holy Spirit testifies with us and leads us to broken, heart, hurting people and Jesus is always about the least, the lost, the lonely and we should be as well. When we point people to Jesus, not only will we be on the right path, but we will lead others to him. Yeah. And that's the church at its best. The world at its worst needs the church at its best. I want to talk to you a lot about those spiritual fathers and mothers that helped me as a young Christian. I wasn't raised in the church. You've heard part of my story. And so after I got saved, it was those godly men who poured themselves into me and taught me how to pray, taught me how to read and memorize scripture. And those men, I am here today because they discipled me and taught me how to live for Jesus, how to love Jesus. I'm forever grateful to them, forever grateful for my pastor who always pointed me to Jesus. Son, love Jesus, love people, and you'll be okay. It sounds so simple. But I don't want it to be simplistic today. That's the real deal. Love Jesus, love people. But there were also some spiritual mothers in my life. And they loved me. They, they, they stayed on me. They didn't let me get away with anything. They were hard on me. They would, look, they would make sure that I behaved with all the other teenagers in church. And they made sure. And I had one of them. When we were all in, in high school and we'd start dating a certain girl, they would come to me and say, you don't want to have anything to do with her. You break up with her right now. You know, they were, they were keen on that kind of stuff. If you're going to be a pastor, you're going to preach her, you don't want to mess around with that girl. So I said, okay, I listened to them. You don't want to have anything to do with them. It was good advice because I waited long enough to find my real sweetie. And, and uh, we've been... We've been there, hanging in there together all these years. But one of those dear mothers, I can see her over on this side of the church, Wednesday night prayer meeting. She would always stand, Mother Jones was her name, and she lived a hard life. Her husband was a drunk and just was mean to her and all that, but fortunately, Toward the end of his life, he gloriously, he got, gloriously got saved, and it's a great... But she came to church alone, and she had a lot of heartbreak. But she would stand and testify, and she would... Tears dripping down her cheeks, and she'd wave that hanky. I love Jesus supremely. That was her words. Every time she testified, I love Jesus supremely. Supremely. So this morning, in closing, thank you, Mother Jones. We love Jesus supremely. Amen. He is the supreme creator, ruler, and our Savior. And he wants to live on the throne of our life. Will we let him? Let's not conform to the world, especially in these days in which we live, but let us let him continue to transform us by his power. So we, we got us a good Christian hymn here to sing. Let's sing it and let Jesus lead us every step of the way. I've chosen the, the hymn, Our God Reigns, as our hymn to sing in response to God and his word. We've been praising the Lord today from beginning to end. Let's continue to praise him as our response to God's word. Our God reigns. Does he reign this morning? Is he, 
Is he in complete control of everything? Is he over everything in your life? I, I want to make sure today that you leave here today and you can say, without a doubt, in my heart, the Lord is over everything. He's Lord of everything in my life. If he's not, would you let him? We don't know how much time we have left on planet Earth. We may not even make it to this next election. Who knows? Jesus may decide to come any moment. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. But if we are here, I want to make sure. I want to help you as pastor. I want to be right there alongside you, pointing you to Jesus. Let him have first place in everything. Can we stand and sing this as our response to God and his word today? The first and last verses of Our God Reigns. Sing it as your testimony today. Sing it as your response to God's word today. declare with one voice today our God reigns That's right. and thank you Lord that you are on the throne today all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto you but your promise to your church and to us today is that you will be with us always to the very end of the age Amen. and so thank you for your presence your sweet presence in this service today from beginning to end, we've tried to keep the focus on you. And so, Lord, as we go forth in your name into this week, and Lord, as we face the battles and the problems and everything that's before us, as we carry the burdens for our loved ones and friends, as we do your good work and allow you to work in us and through us, I pray that you would reign supremely over everything, that you will have first place in everything we say everything we do that's the deep prayer and desire of our heart as we go forth in the name of the lord today we pray in his strong and awesome name and all god's people said amen amen amen, amen. bless you